So let's go to the second argument, the teleological argument from fine-tuning. I'm very happy to admit right off the bat, this is the best argument that the theists have when it comes to cosmology. That's because it plays by the rules. You have phenomena, you have parameters of particle physics and cosmology, and then you have two different models, theism and naturalism, and you want to compare which model is the best fit for the data. I applaud that general approach. Given that, it is still a terrible argument. It is not at all convincing. I want to give you five quick reasons why theism does not offer a solution to the purported fine-tuning problem. First, I am by no means convinced that there is a fine-tuning problem. And again, Dr. Craig offered no evidence for it. It is certainly true that if you change the parameters of nature, our local conditions that we observe around us would change by a lot. I grant that quickly. I do not grant that therefore life could not exist. I will start granting that once someone tells me the conditions under which life can exist. What is the definition of life, for example? If it's just information processing, thinking, or something like that, there's a huge panoply of possibilities. They sound very science fiction-y, but then again, you're the one who's changing the parameters of the universe. The results are going to sound like they come from a science fiction novel. Sadly, we just don't know whether life could exist if the conditions of our universe were very different because we only see the universe that we see. Secondly, God doesn't need to fine-tune anything. We talk about the parameters of physics and cosmology, the mass of the electron, the strength of gravity, and we say if they weren't the numbers that they were, then life itself could not exist. That really underestimates God by a lot, which is surprising from theists, I think. In theism, life is not purely physical. It's not purely a collection of atoms doing things like it is in naturalism. I would think that no matter what the atoms were doing, God could still create life. God doesn't care what the mass of the electron is. He can do what he wants. The only framework in which you can honestly say that the physical parameters of the universe must take on certain values in order for life to exist is naturalism. The third point is that the fine tunings that you think are there might go away once you understand the universe better. They might only be apparent. There's a famous example that theists like to give, or even cosmologists who haven't thought about it enough, that the expansion rate of the early universe is tuned to within one part in 10 to the 60th. That's the naive estimate back of the envelope pencil and paper you would do. But in this case, you can do better. You can go into the equations of general relativity and there is a correct, rigorous derivation of the probability, and when you ask the same question using the correct equations, you find that the probability is one. All but a set of measure zero of early universe cosmologies have the right expansion rate to live for a long time and allow life to exist. I can't say that all parameters fit into that paradigm, but until we know the answer, we can't claim that they are definitely finely tuned. Number four, there's an obvious and easy naturalistic explanation in the form of the cosmological multiverse. People like to worry about the multiverse. It sounds extravagant. I claim the multiverse is amazingly simple. It is not a theory. It is the prediction of physical theories that are themselves quite elegant, small, and self-contained that create universe after universes. There's no reason, no right that we have to expect that the whole entire universe looks like the conditions we have right now. But more importantly, if you take the multiverse as your starting point, you can make predictions. We live in an ensemble, and we should be able to predict the likelihoods that the con conditions around us take different forms. So in cosmology papers dealing with the multiverse, you see graphs like this that try to predict the density of dark matter given other conditions in the multiverse. You do not see graphs like this in the theological papers trying to give God credit for explaining the fine-tuning because theism is not well-defined. Fifth and most importantly, theism fails as an explanation. Even if you think the universe is finely tuned and you don't think that naturalism can solve it, theism certainly does not solve it. If you thought it did, if you played the game honestly, what you would say is, here is the universe that I expect to exist under theism. I will compare it to the data and see if it fits. What kind of universe would we expect? And I claim that over and over again, the universe we expect matches the predictions of naturalism, not theism. So the amount of tuning, if you thought that the physical parameters of our universe were tuned in order to allow life to exist, you would expect enough tuning but not too much. Under naturalism, a physical mechanism could far over-tune by an incredibly large amount that has nothing to do with the existence of life, and that is exactly what we observe. For example, the entropy of the early universe is much, 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 much lower than it needs to be to allow for life. You would expect under theism that the particles and parameters of particle physics would be enough to allow life to exist and have some structure that was designed for some reason, whereas under naturalism you'd expect them to be kind of random and a mess. 
Guess what? They are kind of random in a mess. You would expect under theism life to play a special role in the universe. Under naturalism, you'd expect life to be very insignificant. I hope I don't need to tell you, life is very insignificant as far as the universe is concerned. Here is a photograph from the Hubble Space Telescope of a few hundred out of the hundreds of billions of galaxies in our observable universe. The theistic explanation for cosmological fine tuning asks you to look at this picture and say, I know why it's like that. It's because I was going to be here or we were going to be here. But there is nothing in our experience of the universe that justifies the kind of flattering story we like to tell about ourselves. In fact, I would argue that the failure of theism to explain the fine-tuning of the universe is paradigmatic. It helps understand the other ways in which theism fails to be a better theory than naturalism. What you should be doing over and over again is comparing the predictions or expectations under theism to under naturalism. You find that over and over again, naturalism wins. And I'm going to zoom through these. It's not the individual arguments that are important. It's the accumulated effect. If theism were really true, there's no reason for God to be hard to find. He should be perfectly obvious, whereas in naturalism, you might expect people believe in God, but the evidence to be thin on the ground. Under theism, you'd expect that religious beliefs should be universal. There's no reason for God to give special messages to this or that primitive tribe thousands of years ago. Why not give it to anyone? Whereas under naturalism, you'd expect different religious beliefs inconsistent with, the, with each other to grow up under different local conditions. Under theism, you'd expect religious doctrines to last a long time in a stable way. Under naturalism, you'd expect them to adapt to social conditions. Under theism, you'd expect the moral teachings of religion to be transcendent, progressive, sexism is wrong, slavery is wrong. Under naturalism, you'd expect that they reflect, once again, local mores, sometimes good rules, sometimes not so good. You'd expect the sacred texts under theism to give us interesting information. Tell us about the germ theory of disease. Tell us to wash our hands before we have dinner. Under naturalism, you'd expect that sacred text to be a mishmash, some really good parts, some poetic parts, and some boring parts and mythological parts. Under theism, you'd expect biological forms to be designed. Under naturalism, they would derive from the twists and turns of evolutionary history. Under theism, minds should be independent of bodies. Under naturalism, your personality should change if you're injured, tired, or you haven't had your cup of coffee yet. Under theism, you'd expect that maybe you can explain the problem of evil. God wants us to have free will. But there shouldn't be random suffering in the universe. Life should be essentially just. And at the end of the day, in theism, you basically expect the universe to be perfect. Under naturalism, it should be kind of a mess. This is very strong empirical evidence. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but I can explain all of that. I know you can explain all, so can I. It's not hard to come up with ex post facto justifications for why God would have done it that way. Why is it not hard? Because theism is not well defined. That's what computer scientists call a bug, not a feature. Immanuel Kant famously said, there will never be an Isaac Newton for a blade of grass. In other words, sure, you can find some physical explanation for the motion of the planets, but never for something as exquisitely organized and complex as a biological organism. Except, of course, that Charles Darwin then went and did exactly that. We can paraphrase Dr. Craig's message as saying, there will never be an Isaac Newton for the cosmos. But everything we know about the history of science and the current state of physics says we should be much more optimistic than that. Thank you.